Okay, well, I'm not going to have my beautiful face before you tonight, so you'll have to pretend you're on the radio. I like to watch uh, current event things, and I like to, of course, study history. One of the things I've done ever since YouTube was available is to go back and look at old videotapes of various political figures and other things of that nature. But the problem is, is that every time I listen to one of the presidents, I can't hardly listen to it very long because they use about as much bad language as anybody knows how to use. It just grates on my nerves. And I've listened to about four presidents, past presidents, and when they're on the phone or whoever it is they're talking to in the office, they don't hesitate to use uh, terrible language. And yet in the same breath, they will be talking about morals, and ethical conduct, and they don't seem to get it. And I don't suppose they do, but I think they're representative of a great many people today and for a long, long time in this world. Isaiah once wrote, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Well, I guess we can say we live in a generation of substitutes. Wood is being replaced with plastic, and that's been going on for a long time. All of that's involved with the materials when it comes to what's used to construct this, that, or the other. You see all sorts of synthetic fibers, all kinds of food substitutes. But when you see men that are supposed to be men of integrity, honorable men, examples, the highest office of our land, and yet they really talk like they were born in the gutter, have no compunction of conscience to use the foul language they do. You realize that if they can do such a thing, anybody else can, and many, many, many do. Jesus still says, by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. James had a whole lot to say about bridling the tongue. He made it very clear that the tongue no man can tame. But it is our goal, it's our desire, and we put forth the necessary efforts to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ, which can't be done if you don't know the Bible, because there's where his thoughts are found. There where, there's where his will is revealed. And once we're obedient to the gospel, raised to walk in newness of life, then we want the real thing, not substitutes. We don't want that which is pretending to be one thing or representing itself as one thing when in reality it's something completely different. So we want to be pure. We want to be holy. We want to be before God honest and godly as the Bible defines godliness. We want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Nothing can take the place of complete dedication on the part of every member, that is, every member of the church. And we're very mindful of Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Some brethren, I'm ashamed to say, hide their convictions before they will suffer embarrassment. I suppose some people around a bunch of worldly folks who use foul language Wanting to be one of the boys will use some of that same language. Just say, I'm one of you. Well, who wants to be somebody like that? Evil companionships corrupts good morals. We're to be the light of the world. We're to be the salt of the earth. Thus, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Thus, our words come out of the heart. 
Thus, we guard our heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. We want to be sure that we are being what the Bible says we must be. And there's no substitute for that. One of the things, as I move away from that, that we all need to cultivate, and that is love for those still lost in sin. So many, many, many people have no concept of what it means to be lost in sin, to be separated from God, to be one heartbeat away from eternity. And yet we see the rich man, when he died, he lit up his eyes in torment. Thus, immediately, for the one who dies lost, one enters into a state of torment. That's a horrible thing. It's something that all of us want to escape. And yet today, I guess more and more people deny there is such a place as torment or any kind of accounting for our actions and our words. And so many people just don't believe the Bible. But we who have been redeemed, we who are Christians, should want to win souls for Christ today as much as anybody ever did in the first century. And a congregation of people who don't love the precious souls of men, women, boys, and girls who are lost in sin, enough to prepare themselves and then to do what's necessary to take the gospel to them, is missed something somewhere in a great way. We may be negligent in our prayer. We may be negligent in our giving because the work of the church is to save souls and we, we give to the Lord of our money, then we're giving to the work of the church. When I think of people who just won't attend the services, and yet they get upset at folks, sort of like these presidents do, uh, want to talk about ethics while they're using all sorts of foul language, and smutty jokes and such things as that. Then I wonder in one realm how much difference there is from them to some of us. When we forget the loss, and we're not that particular about walking the straight and narrow way of bringing our thoughts and subjection to Christ, learning to love the souls of men and women, boys and girls who are lost in sin, not realizing or thinking about the fact that God has charged the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. These things we would do well to consider in our own lives. Moral purity is at a premium, and yet it's not considered that. To be truly moral, the way the Bible talks about morality, really one must become a Christian. That doesn't mean a person can't live morally and not be a Christian. It just means that it's not going to do that person any good to live a moral life and reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. We in the church are to be right religiously and morally. And we must keep ourselves, to use biblical terminology, unspotted from the world. There's nothing that will make up for our efforts to do what is right and stop doing what's wrong and knowing the Bible well enough to tell the difference. The church may suffer embarrassment the way the world looks at things or shame, but for the child of God, one realizes when you're right with God, whatever the world thinks of you, individually, personally, you understand you're acceptable to God. And thus what the world thinks, they'll just have to think that way. The church will suffer embarrassment and shame from time to time, and it will suffer that more and more as it lives a righteous life. That is each member. So God's people must take an unyielding stand against all manner of moral impurity. Gambling, social drinking, dancing, immodest apparel, and other evils that are similar in character. 
to fail to do this is to invite disaster. Now look at our country and disasters upon us. It won't matter whether we have wealth or we're prominent in whatever the way the world defines prominence. It's a matter of whether we're right with God. And those who will be real Christians, genuinely faithful to God and the Lord's church, are not going to try to find substitutes. They just simply want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in their lives. That comes from dedication to study the Bible, worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and loving the brethren, and loving those outside of Christ enough to take the gospel to them. So these are things that are as old as the Bible is, as far as truth is concerned, old as the gospel, old as what it is to be a Christian. And they never grow old as far as the way we're to live. And so I wanted to spend a little time on this particular subject regarding moral purity, and being a Christian and godly living, how easy it is for us to slip slide away and become like the world. So I hope this encourages us to do what's right that come what may. Thank you.